Total War Rome 2 Empire Divided released on the 30th of November 2017, and unlike the base game, is currently available on Windows PC only, with no signs of a Mac release. It's developed by Creative Assembly and published by Sega. Empire Divided marks a first for Creative Assembly. It's the first time they've created content for a title after a new title has come out. It's also the most expensive DLC they've created for Total War Rome 2 by about 20%. This review will critique Empire Divided from the perspective of owning the base game Total War Rome 2 already. If you don't own Rome 2, I recommend getting it on a sale. It's been 75% off and there's loads of content to chew through before you even need to think about this DLC. Do not buy this game for this DLC and I'll expand on why later. Empire Divided pushes the Rome 2 start date forward to 270 AD, better known as the Crisis of the 3rd Century. Here the Roman Empire is fractured, split into several independent factions led by emperors and monarchs vying for overall control. All the while, external forces push on Rome's borders looking for weakness and opportunity to reclaim lost homeland. There are 10 playable factions to choose from and 5 of the 10 factions are classed as heroic, meaning they have more elaborate victory conditions and their leaders cannot die in battle. Each of the 10 factions have their own unique rosters with a little bit of crossover between the Roman sub-factions and the barbarians. The factions are divided into cultural groups, each with their own benefits. We have the Roman Empire with Palmyra under Queen Zenobia, Gallic Rome under Tetricus, and Rome under Aurelian. The Roman factions all own a significant amount of territory. Palmyra are the smallest, starting with 11 territories. Gallic Rome are mid-sized, owning 17 territories, and a further 16 through Klein states. Rome are the biggest powerhouse, with 23 territories and 24 through their Klein states. So playing as a Roman faction is going to be one of maintaining large empires and multiple front wars, something that can be overwhelming for a game start and a little off-putting for most Total War players who enjoy building up from smaller areas. There are also several new factions, which are mostly client states of the Romans, that occupy significant portions of the map as well. Britannia own most of Britannia, Hispania Citeria own a large bulk of Iberia, and Lydia own a great portion of Asia Minor. Then we also have familiar factions which have been Romanized and client stated. Galatia, Egypt and Numidia for instance, all field legionaries in large parts of the map. So no doubt this isn't a surprise to many, but you'll be fighting a lot of Roman style troops regardless of the faction that you play. While not as straight up carbon copy armies like with the Imperator Augustus map, a little bit of fatigue does start to set in when you're fighting Roman levies and cohorts all around the map. It's fitting for the era, but it gets a bit dull nevertheless. The most interesting combat is often in the north and the east, as you'll see a lot more unit variety out there. The Roman rosters largely share a base of a few units and then have their own strengths. Palmyra's roster relies mostly on spear and pike infantry, with very few melee additions, so expect a lot of hammer and anvil with some chariots and cataphract shock cavalry. Gallic Rome's roster relies more heavily on a combination of spear infantry and melee, which is also complemented with chariots. Rome has the most traditional roster, being largely melee infantry dominated with strong melee cavalry and with the new addition of pikes. For the Germanic kingdoms, we have Saxony, Gothi, and Marcomanni. These factions are much smaller, with Saxony and Marcomanni starting with just one territory, and the Gothi start with just three. The Gothi are a heroic faction led by the leader Canabouds. Each of these factions has fairly unique rosters, which, like the Romans, play off of each other to shake up the playstyles a bit. Largely, though, they have quite a bit of variety, and the Gothi and Marcomanni's rosters feature female warriors, which is worth pointing out as you normally can't field those units without the Daughters of Mars DLC. Next are the Eastern Empires. We have the Sassanids, which are the final heroic faction led by Hormizd, and Armenia, who are a satrapy of the Sassanids. The Sassanids, much like the Romans, start out with a large chunk of land covering 13 territories and several satrapies. Armenia start with just four territories, but are pretty interesting as you can choose when to rise up against your master or use their protection for your own gain. Both of their rosters are traditionally eastern, with heavy horse archers, cataphracts, pikes and spearmen being the main backbone of the army, with the Sassanids also fielding Indian war elephants. The last two factions are the Alani and the Caledoniae. These factions start on the extreme edges of the map. The Alani are heavily cavalry focused, and the Caledoniae are more traditionally barbarian, with a focus on ambush units and chariots. And that's it for all the factions. As mentioned, they have new rosters, which share elements and models from the base game, but have been expanded upon with some new models and textures. 
There isn't, however, any new voice work or dialogue, so expect the same barbarian and Roman speeches and responses that you may be used to. It gets pretty tiresome hearing the same voices in Gallic Rome as you do in Egypt, just because they're both technically Roman. So what do heroic factions have over the normal factions? Well, not that much really. They have a leader that cannot die in battle, which typically makes them fairly powerful over time. This leader also has unique event chains. These events are basically dialogue boxes that tell a story and ask you to choose one of four answers. After 40 or so turns and four dialogue boxes, the dialogues will end and you'll get a result. The result I received was insultingly bad. I received an 8% morale and an 8% movement buff for 5 turns. I had no intention on fighting with that army for a while, so nothing even happened. I enjoyed reading the story though, but it was severely anticlimactic. Choose either vengeance, greatness, prosperity, or existence. Here, have an 8% campaign movement bonus for literally 5 months, cool. A few new mechanics working their way into the campaign is banditry, plagues, and cults. Banditry is a new hindrance mechanic, kind of like corruption. It's a number that gets bigger as you get bigger and have more trade partners. It will essentially lower your food and can cause province-wide effects to happen where banditry runs rife. I think this was introduced because there are so many large empires in the DLC and it's a way of stifling the snowball effect you get with multiple client states and trade partners. Now you'll need to build anti-banditry buildings, more food buildings and think a little bit about trade if it's worth it or not. For my main campaign as the Gothi, I was able to completely ignore it, but you will feel some effect when you reach 20 or more settlements. Something I did notice though is that the AI seems to ignore it completely, as it doesn't affect public order. Plagues are self-explanatory, it's essentially a disease that will hamper growth and hurt public order. It can then spread from town to town with moving armies and trade routes. Sanitation will now be required to balance out squalor or to stop outbreaks from happening. This system seems to mirror that from Attila, but with far more ways to control it and less effects if you don't. You can get technologies, sanitation buildings, and also temples that reduce the outbreak chance, and when you do have a plague, it doesn't really do much and is fairly easy to quarantine. Cults are a new type of building that you can construct for free and come with a bunch of benefits. The drawback is that it'll eat away at your culture, so you have to balance the effects against your public order just like with any other building. When the culture starts to take hold a little bit, you'll get religious events that help out the province every now and then, so they can be pretty useful to use and can be pretty easily balanced out with the temple that provides your own culture. If you do muck it up, destroying the building will cost money. Sometimes you feel helpless that there's a damn Christian building you can't remove upsetting your people. It happens the most when you capture a settlement that has built several cults into it. Either let them stay or pay to get rid of them. It's a nice idea, but they're so cheap to remove, I feel like destroying their buildings should cause public unrest, or it should cost way more. The building system with its new additions is actually a lot of fun to manage. I've never really felt like that for quite a long time, but I feel like the amount of options available creates a lot of interesting gameplay. There's around 10 building chains, but each chain has a further 3 to 5 sub-chains within it. It's impossible to fill up everything, and pretty difficult to even just get all the military buildings you want in a single province. It doesn't change the formula too much from Rome 2 already, but the addition of banditry and sanitation does make for a more interesting building system, and unlike Attila, provinces can be two regions, three regions or four, so you'll need some big provinces to provide extra help to help out the smaller ones. I actually really really like it. I don't think I built any two provinces the same, which is a very good sign. I had a quick look around the other factions building chains as well and similarly they have entirely new chains and unique faction specific buildings that really enhance the empire management gameplay. Another rework I had a lot of fun with, and I didn't think I'd ever say it, is technologies. The tech tree is now split into campaign, army and battle, and then governance, economy and culture. Because of the amount of buildings that arrive with each technology, and the fast paced nature of the tree early on, it really feels rewarding and quick to research the improvements you want. The progression just feels natural and well thought out. Unfortunately, the only issue is that the UI doesn't tell you what a building will do that you get from a technology. You may see that it unlocks five buildings, but you can't actually see their effects easily. Instead, you have to open up a region with the same building chain or an empty slot and look it up. It's just a bit tedious and it slows down the process of looking for an upgrade a lot. Lastly, there are new random event dilemmas. Something will happen like rats will infest an area and you'll be asked to fix it somehow. Typically you'll find the best answer after it happens once or twice, and then just always go with that. It can feel a bit cheap at times when randomly an area suffers 5 sanitation for no fault of your own, and then your only way of solving it is a random answer. 
It kind of removes the element of strategy, and while I'm okay with random things happening that you can think about to fix, this just doesn't feel like that, and it seems like there isn't too much thought behind it. That's it for all of the new campaign features. Of course, Empire Divided has launched alongside the Free Politics and Power update, and this DLC doesn't really make any significant use of it. Secessions can occur if you're not careful, but I found that because the game moves at 12 turns per year, generals rarely die, and because your faction leader cannot die in battle, it's extremely easy to have a lot of gravitas and game the politics easily, gaining all of the benefits. On the battle side of things, there have been no changes. The AI performs the same, and the same bugs that have been present since the launch of the game are still there, with the addition of a few new ones. This is very much a content pack that sits on top of a shaky foundation. Apart from Queen Zenobia, there's no new speeches, no new music, no new towns, and the same recycled dialogue. It is very much the Rome 2 battles as you know them. The new units themselves are 50-50 in terms of aesthetics. Some look really, really nice, and others look a little bit rushed perhaps, with clipping on their faces and clothes that seem to be a little bit bigger than their bodies, creating a really boxy effect, with some pretty stretched textures. In terms of gameplay, the units are fun to use, although the balancing seems a little odd for some of the units, with shock cavalry doing better in melee than melee cavalry that is more expensive. So certain things like that kind of bring the quality down a little bit, and I'm not even one for balance really, so if I'm noticing things, then it's probably got even more issues. The naval aspect of the game is as usual a buggy affair with not much attention placed on naval warfare and their units. Both factions have a total of 7 ship types, with Rome and the Sassanids fielding more complete navies. A navy will still beat transports, so the lack of variety doesn't really impact the campaign all that much. Naval warfare was never enjoyable in Rome 2, and there's no change here. If anything, there's an admission of how bad it is by how little attention it is received. So that's it for the Empire Divided DLC. While I've enjoyed my playthrough as the Gothi, I feel like it's mostly because I enjoy Rome 2 in general, and the building system has been quite refreshing. When I analyse any one new feature that's been added with this DLC, you know, the stuff you're really paying for, it kind of falls down. The heroic events are, as I mentioned before, insulting in how much they waste your time. Cults are a nice idea, but are largely ignorable. The same with banditry, and the same with plagues. The random dilemmas always have the same outcomes. The armies, while having some new models and units, mostly feel to be of mediocre quality with rough textures and recycled voice work. The game's largest bugs have gone unfixed, and new gameplay altering ones have been introduced. This is a campaign pack that doesn't even add a new campaign map, and it charges 20% more than the other packs. Sure, the era might not ask for a whole new map to be made, but moving towns, redrawing borders, naming provinces, or placing landmarks like Hadrian's Wall would have gone a long way. Empire Divided feels like a mediocre DLC asking for a premium price. The mod Constantine Rise of Christianity by Dresden and crew essentially created something very similar to this DLC three years ago. If you roll back your patch to patch 17, you can still play it. I've also done a video back on it in 2014, so you can check that out if you want in the description. Watch out, I'm uh, pretty shy in it. If you're going into Rome 2 for the first time, I'd recommend getting Hannibal at the gates first, and maybe grab this on a sale further down the line if you're still looking for more content. Like the score says, I don't think the DLC is bad, it's just mediocre and expensive for what it is. Please let me know what you think of Empire Divided so far, and let me know what you thought of the review. Consider liking or sharing the video on your favourite sites to help the channel grow, it really, really helps. Reviews for Republic of Play are primarily funded through Patreon, I couldn't do this without the backing that I have there. If you like this content and want to support it further, please consider supporting on Patreon, absolutely anything helps, and you get rewards that grant you a say in what games and DLC we cover next. Also check out our social links below, we've got a nice and friendly Discord server and Steam group you can join. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.